Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Harold, for your very kind introduction. Uh, if I just may set the record straight, my difference with uh, Margaret Thatcher, which uh, caused me to resign from uh, government, had nothing whatever to do with Europe. But it's all set out, anyhow, in the volume of memoirs uh, to which you very kindly referred. But thank you, above all, for inviting me to talk to you at this conference and to come to Princeton, one of the preeminent universities of the whole world. Uh, this is my first visit to Princeton, not in fact my first connection with Princeton, because I'm glad to say that uh, when I founded my think tank, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, uh, some seven or eight or maybe nine years ago, uh, we have a, an academic advisory council, and I'm glad to say we have two professors from Princeton on that academic advisory council. Uh, the title of this conference is inadvertently, uh, but importantly, somewhat misleading. It's called Europe and the Challenges of Brexit, uh, but the issue is not Europe, with its great history, incomparable culture, and diverse peoples, but the European Union. And that's a very different matter indeed. To confuse the two is both geographically and historically obtuse. Uh, Switzerland, for example, is, while quintessentially European, is not in the European Union and is incidentally flourishing. And European civilization existed long before the coming of the European Union and will continue long after this episode in Europe's history is hopefully over. On the European mainland, it has always been well understood that the whole purpose of European integration was political and that economic integration was simply a means to a political end. In my country, and perhaps also over here, but I'm not so sure, of course, uh, that has been much less well understood, particularly with the within the business community, who sometimes find it hard to grasp that politics can trump economics. But the fact that the objective has always been political doesn't mean that it's in any way disreputable. Indeed, the most compelling original objective was highly commendable. It was bluntly to eliminate the threat to Europe and the wider world from a recrudescence of German militarism by placing the German tiger in a European cage. Whether or not the uh, European Union has in fact had much to do with it, that objective has been achieved. There is no longer a threat from German militarism. The fact that today German influence is increasing peacefully, largely at the expense of France, as a result of Germany's superior economic performance is not something to which anyone can legitimately object. But in the background, there has always been another political objective behind European integration, one which is now firmly in the foreground, and that's the creation of a federal European superstate, a United States of Europe. Don't be seduced, incidentally, as too many in the State Department are by the resonance of that phrase. Not one of the conditions that contributed to making a success of the United States of America, not one, exists in the case of the European Union. But that's what European Union is all about. That's its sole raison d'etre. And unlike the first objective, it is profoundly misguided. And it's certainly not right for the United Kingdom. As far back as January 1989, as Chancellor, and well before the single currency had come into being, I pointed out in a speech at London's Chatham House that the only way that European monetary union could be made to work would be if it were to be accompanied by full fiscal <coughs> union, which in turn required uh, full political union. I warned that it would therefore be most unwise to go ahead with the project, since whatever the European elites and above all the bureaucracy may have wished. A full-blooded European political union was not wanted by the majority of the peoples of Europe. And that remains the case today, indeed, uh, more so than ever before. Unfortunately, a fundamental contempt for democracy has always been one of the most striking and least attractive characteristics of the European integrationist movement. However, uh, noble its intentions. 
The need for monetary union to be accompanied by both fiscal and political union is now widely accepted and it's been endorsed most recently by the European Union's own so-called Five Presidents report on the completion of monetary union, which calls for the creation of a single Eurozone finance ministry, presumably headed by a single Eurozone finance minister by 2025. And it's also what all economic history tells us. There's not a single major monetary union in the world that is not also a fiscal union and a political union. Uh, the logic, uh, both economic and political, is incontrovertible. Indeed, the monetary union tout court was deliberately designed to fail. The father of the euro, Jacques Delors, whom I knew very well when, as French finance minister, he was my opposite number in the European Community's ECOFIN Council <coughs> and elsewhere, was well aware that it could make sense only as a stepping stone to political union. It was a colossal, and some might say grossly irresponsible, gamble. Not least because the lesson of history is that monetary union invariably follows rather than precedes political union. That was the case, to cite just three examples, with the United States monetary union, the German monetary union, and the Italian monetary union. Hence, in large part, the continuing Eurozone disaster and with it, continuing European economic underperformance. But the coming into being of monetary union, there can be no doubt whatever of the determination of the leaders of the European Union to persist with it at all costs, has fundamentally changed the nature of the European Union and of non-Eurozone Britain's relationship with it. In his new book, The End of Alchemy, the former governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, devotes a chapter uh, to the European Union. And in it he points out that, I quote, the crisis of monetary union will drag on and it cannot be resolved without confronting either the supranational ambitions of the European Union or the dam democratic nature of sovereign national governments. One or the other will have to give way. Muddling through may continue for some while, but eventually the choice between a return to national monies and democratic control or a clear and abrupt transfer of political sovereignty to a European government cannot be avoided, unquote. And he concludes that, and I quote for the last time, the tragedy of monetary union in Europe is not that it might collapse, but that given the degree of political commitment among the leaders of Europe, it might continue bringing economic stagnation to the largest currency block in the world." Unquote. Meanwhile, for the United Kingdom to remain in the European Union would be particularly perverse, since not even the political elite in my country wish to see this country absorbed into a United States of Europe. To be part of a political project whose objective we emphatically don't share cannot possibly make sense. It is true that our present Prime Minister argues that he secured a British opt-out from the political union, but this is completely meaningless. We continue to be fully su subject to the ever-growing corpus of EU legislation and regulation, all of it directed towards the achievement of full political union. And the theology of the acquis communautaire reinforced by the so-called passerelle clause of the EU's Lisbon Treaty, means that competences transferred from the member states to the Union can never be repatriated. The traffic is only in one direction. But, comes the inevitable question, what is your alternative to membership of the European Union? A more absurd question it would be hard to imagine, because the alternative to being in the European Union is not being in the European Union. It may come as a shock to the little Europeans that most of the world is not in the European Union. <laughs> and indeed, most of these countries are doing better economically than most of the European Union. Moreover, out of the European Union, the UK would no longer have to pay its annual EU subscription of some $14 billion a year and rising for nothing in return. Yes, nothing. 
for the figure is calculated after netting off everything British farmers and scientists and others at present receive from the European Union. Nor would UK business and industry have to carry the burden of excessive European regulation, which bears down particularly hard on the SME, small and medium-sized enterprises, sector. Yes, of course, British businesses would have to conform to EU regulation when exporting to the European Union, just as they have to conform to US regulation when exporting to the United States. But exports to the European Union represent only some 13% of UK GDP, and the proportion is declining. The liberation of the remaining 87% of the British economy from a bureaucratic Brussels which believes that more Europe is always a good thing and that more Europe means more EU regulation is greatly to be desired. Uh, to suppose that being within the so-called single market confers a great economic benefit is palpably absurd. If it did, most of our European partners would not be in the mess that they're in today with miserably low growth, high unemployment, and ultra-high youth unemployment. Moreover, there's a more fundamental reason than this, which goes beyond the mischief of the single currency. Towards the end of his long life, the great Fritz Hayek was interviewed by the American philosopher W. W. Barclay, who asked him about his differences with the Keynesians. Hayek replied in these terms, and I quote, Keynes, against his intentions, had stimulated the development of macroeconomics. I was convinced, not only his particular conclusions, but the whole foundation of macroeconomics was wrong. So I wanted to demonstrate that we had to return to microeconomics. End of quotation. This is of the first importance. Over anything but the very short term, national economic performance depends on the efficiency and flexibility of the microeconomy, sometimes known as the supply side. And that insight is what drove the economic reforms of the Thatcher administrations of the 1980s, of which I was a part, and it worked. An important element of that was intelligent deregulation. By contrast, the European addic Union's addiction to ever more regulation can only continue to damage its economic performance. Of course, there are some who find the whole concept of national interest objectionable, and they see European Union as a way of getting away from that. In an age of globalization, it is argued the nation state has become an anachronism. History provides this is perhaps the simplest refutation of this muddled thesis. The late 19th century is widely recognized as having been the heyday of the nation state. Yet it was also the epoch that saw the first coming of economic globalization, an era of massive economic progress, which came to an end only with the onset of the First World War. Others argue that whether or not the nation state has in fact become obsolete, it certainly ought to be, given the havoc that nationalism has wreaked over the past hundred years. Now, there are three great forces that make the weather that governments have to steer through. These are self-interest, including the interests of one's children, nationalism, and religion. Each of them can certainly turn ugly but each of them can also be a force for good. It makes no more sense to reject nationalism to court because of its evil exploitation by Nazi Germany than to reject religion to court because of the excesses of militant Islamic fundamentalism. Indeed, I would argue that it's not nationalism or patriotism which is the mischief, and which of those two you call it depends on whether you approve of it or not, uh, but ideology. Think fascism, communism, and Islamic fundamentalism. For while nationalism or patriotism can properly respect the nationalism or patriotism of others, ideology accepts no such limitation. So far as self-interest is concerned, Adam Smith long ago demonstrated how the market economy channels this into public benefit. But nationalism too 
is important in this context. It is no historical accident that the evolution of the nation state and the evolution of the market economy coincided. For the market economy rests on a non-economic infrastructure of which a vital component is the rule of law. And in a free society, the rule of law will work satisfactorily only if the people feel that at the, in the last resort it is their law. Their law in two important senses. It's the law of their country, to which they have a keen sense of belonging, and it is the law of their government, which they have democratically elected, and which, even more important, they can democratically eject. We are told that EU membership is necessary for our security in a dangerous world, and that is poppycock. But I will leave David Owen to deal with that side of the issue. Uh, the world, the fact is, the matter is, that the world we live in today is a very different one from that of 1973, when the UK joined what's then known as the common market. Britain today is the very opposite of the sick man of Europe we were then. Germany has been peacefully reunited and has forsworn any militaristic ambitions. The Soviet Union is no more. The world economy has been transformed by the coming of globalization, with the emerging economies of Asia, Latin America, and much of Africa steadily catching up with the West as they abandon socialist economics and embrace the market economy. This is the world of today and tomorrow, which the United Kingdom, freed from the constraints of the EU, has the opportunity to take the greatest advantage of. Even Britain's EU-obsessed Foreign Office, in its 2013 Balance of Competences report, has documented how and why there is no other European nation which has comparable global potential, from our membership of the Commonwealth to the fact of English being the world's language, from our bilateral relationships with key members of our former empire to London's position, which owes nothing whatever to EU membership, as one of the world's two preeminent global financial centres. Indeed, London remains threatened by misguided EU legislation, not least the proposed financial transactions tax, which Chancellor George Osborne has fought vainly to be declared illegal. It's of course true that London is helped by being in the European time zone, but that will still be the case outside the European Union. Uh, the financial transactions tax episode incidentally illustrates a wider point. For any member state of the European Union, EU law automatically overrides national law. In the same way, the European Court of Justice is superior to all national courts, including the UK Supreme Court. But the ECJ is not just a legal entity, it's also a political entity. One of the fundamental institutions of the European Union, it is committed to furthering the cause of full-blooded political union. According to the European treaties, while other legislation can be introduced by a majority vote, a new tax requires unanimity. Britain voted against the proposed financial transaction <coughs> tax, and this was the basis of the unsuccessful British decision to appeal to the ECJ. And it was unsuccessful because the ECJ blithely ruled that the financial transactions tax was not a tax. I have explained why, in my considered opinion, European Union membership is on balance economically harmful to the UK, and why Britain's economic future is a global one. But at the end of the day, the issue before the British people is a much more fundamental one. <coughs> the European Union suffers not only from a bureaucratic surplus, it also has, as is widely accepted, a serious democratic deficit. Those who are committed to the European project, the creation of a full-blooded political union, see this simply as a transitional phase. Once the United States of Europe has been achieved, it will, of course, be a democracy. Maybe so. Although, as has frequently been observed, there is no genuine European demos, whereas there is, of course, a very real British, of that matter, French demos. And I speak as someone who lives nowadays in France. 
What is abundantly clear is that the EU as we know it now is profoundly undemocratic. This is a matter of concern to many people throughout the European Union, but it's a matter of particular concern in the UK with our addiction to freedom and democracy. And it's intimately connected with something even older and even more fundamental, self-government, which importantly includes control of our own borders, which we cannot achieve so long as we remain within the EU. Membership of the European Union, however well-intentioned, is an affront to self-government which offers nothing that remotely compensates for this. What the British people want, I believe, and what we now have in our grasp is a genuinely global future as a self-governing democracy. Uh, to conclude briefly, the case for Brexit, in my judgment, is overwhelming. But what does that imply for other member states? Should they continue the onward march to a United States of Europe? Or should the entire project be abandoned, having served whatever useful purpose it once had, including, incidentally, and not to be dismissed lightly, proffering a helping hand to the former members of the Soviet Empire following the collapse of that empire some 15 years ago? That's not for me to say. We are all of us the products of our own histories, and our histories are all significantly different not least in modern times. It may well be, in particular, that the EU's leading member, Germany, still feels more comfortable if it is wearing European rather than German clothes. But that is for them to decide. It is certainly no argument against Brexit. Thank you.